What's better than Anchor's podcast creation tools? Nothing. Mankind has always searched for evidence of God's perfection and we found it. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use straight from your phone or computer. The creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the the lesser of the podcast platforms, Stitcher. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I've made $5, and I've been doing this for three months. So, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Have the people at work been needling you? Have your children been clawing at you, demanding your attention and food? It's time to go to bed. And it's time to hear a bedtime story. Here on Bedtime with Glenn. Let me whisper a uh, classic fairy tale softly in your ear. As I also give you a content warning. Most fairy tales are horrible with a lot of murder and other adult things that I don't really want to talk about out loud. But luckily there's not a lot of swearing. So nuzzle up, bury that head in your little pillow, pull that blanket up to your chin, and enjoy Bedtime with Glenn. October was fun, wasn't it? I thought it was. It gives you better stories to read for the month that are a little more exciting. But now it's November. And the only thing we got going for November, uh, at least here in America, is Thanksgiving. Which is thick with controversy as far as holidays go. That and Columbus Day. So, I'm not playing into that. Instead, for bedtime stories, we're going to read a short story from the collection called More Bedtime Stories by Louise Chandler Moulton, the author of Bedtime Stories and Some Woman's Hearts, uh, written in 1875. Uh, The story we'll be reading is called Against the Wind and Tide, a story about a bad boy. Let's dig in. Jack Ramsdell was a bad boy. He had been a bad boy so long that secretly he was rather tired of it. But he really did not know how to help himself. It was his reputation, and it was a curious thing how naturally we all live up to our reputations. That is to say, we do the things which are expected of us. There is a deal of homely sense in the old proverb. Give a dog a bad name and hang him. Give a boy a bad name, and he is reasonably sure to deserve one. Not but that Jack Ramsdale had fairly earned his bad name. His mother had died before he was old enough to remember her, eh, so he had never known what a home was. Once, that is, father was unusually good-natured. He had asked him some questions about his mother. She was one of God's saints, if there ever was one, the man answered, half-reluctantly. Everybody wondered uh, that she took up with me, but maybe it was because she saw I needed her more than anybody else did. She might have made a different man of me if she'd lived. At least, I've always thought so. I never drank so much but when she was alive, but when I kept a comfortable home over her head. But when she is gone, it didn't appear to me there was anything left to live for. I lacked comfort, sorely, and I don't say, but... What I've sought for it in bypaths, by and forbidden paths, as she used to say. (laughs) I wish I could have seen her, said Jack. She was a dreadful motherly creature, and was always hanging over you. Cold nights, I've known her to get up half a dozen times, often to see if the uh, clothes was all up your shoulders. Uh, And sometimes I'd seen her stand there looking down at you in the biting cold till I thought she'd freeze. But I didn't dare say a thing, for her lips were moving. 
and I knew she was praying for you. She was a praying woman, your mother was. I used to think her prayers would save us both. I can't make out how she looked, Jack persisted. He was so anxious to hear something about this dead mother who he had loved. Uh, Ever since she died, he had been knocked around from pillar to post, as they say, with his father. Sam Ramsdale was good help, as all the farmers knew when he was sober. But he was not reliable, and when he had the disadvantage of always being encumbered with the boy whom he took with him everywhere. An unkempt, undisciplined little fellow whom no one liked. Now, as his father talked, it seemed to him so strange a thing to think that someone used to stand beside his bed in cold winter nights and pray for him. That he could hardly believe it, and said again out of his desolate longing, I wish I could have seen how she looked. I don't suppose folks would have had as much to look at, his father spoke in a musing sort of way. She is a little pale slip of a woman, the soft yellow hair drooping about her white face, and her eyes as blue as... Then blue flowers he picked up along the road. But there, I can't talk about her, and I ain't going to. What's more, and you don't ever ask me again. From that time, Jack never dared to ask any more questions about his mother. But all through his troublesome, turbulent boyhood, he remembered the meager outlines of the story which had been told him. No matter how bad he had been through the day, the nights were few when he failed to think... How once a pale slip of a woman, with soft yellow hair around her white face, and eyes blue as the blue gentians, had bent above his slumbers and said prayers for him. When he was ten years old, his father died in the poorhouse. Drink and enfeebled his constitution, a sudden cold did the rest. There were a few weeks of terrible suffering, and then the end came. Jack was with him to the last. There was nowhere else for him to be, and his father liked to have him in his uh, sight. One day, just before the end, when they were all alone, the man called the boy to his bedside. Uh, I can't tell you to follow my example, Jack. That's the shame of it. I've got to hold myself up as a warning and not as an example. Just you steer clear, oh, my ways as you can. But remember that your mother was a praying woman. I suppose nobody believe it, Jack, but since I've been lying here, I've uh, kind of felt nearer to her than I ever did before since she died. Seems as if I could almost hear her praying for me, and I think by times that the God she lives so close to won't say no. It's the eleventh hour, Jack, the eleventh hour. I know that as well as anybody, but she used to sing a hymn <clears throat> about while a lamp holds out to burn. When I get there, I shall get rid of this awful thirst for drink. It's been an awful thirst. No hunger that I know of can match it. But I shall get rid of that when this old body goes to pieces. And what does a Savior mean if it ain't that he'll save us from our sins if we ask him? As he said these last words, he seemed sinking into a sort of stupor. But he started out of it to say once more, I never follow my example, Jack boy. Remember, your mother was a praying woman. Those were the last connected words anyone ever heard him speak. After that night came on the double night of darkness and of death. Once or twice, the woman who acted as a nurse bending over her heard him mutter, The eleventh hour, Jack. And afterwards, she wondered whether it was a presentiment, for it was just at eleven o'clock that he died. Jack had been sent to bed a little before, and when he got up in the morning, he knew that all was alone in the world. After the funeral deacon, Small took him home. He wouldn't be of much use for two or three years to come. The deacon said maybe he could drive up the cows, uh, ride uh, the horse to plow and scare the crows away from the corn, but he couldn't earn his salt for a number of years to come. However, somebody must take him, and he guessed he would. It would be a good spell before the creature would come of age, and the last part of the time he might be smart enough to pay off old scores. But surely Jack Ramsdale must have eaten more salt than 
every boy of ten ate before if he did not work enough for it, for it was Jack here and Jack there all day long. Jack did everybody's errands. Jack drew Mrs. Small's baby grandchild in his little covered wagon. Jack scoured the knives. Jack brought the wood. Jack picked up berries. Jack weeded the flower beds. For being an idle little chap in everyone's way as he had been in his father's time, he was pressed right into hard service. For more hours in the day than any man worked about the place. Now, work is good for boys, but ha <laughs> I'll work and no play. Worse yet, all work and no love is not good for anyone. Jack grew bitter. And where he dared to be cruel, he was cruel. But where he dared to be insolent, oh, he was insolent. Not toward Deacon Small, however, where those qualities displayed. The Deacon was a hard master, and the boy feared and hated and obeyed him. But as the years went on, uh, five of them, he grew to be generally considered a, a bad boy. At 15, he was as strong of his age, a man almost in size. His schooling had been confined to the short winter terms, and he had always been the terror of every successive schoolmaster. When he was 15, a new teacher came, a handsome, graceful young man, just out of college. He was slight rather than stout, well-dressed, well-mannered, and fit. He could have said, for a lady's drawing room rather than the country schoolhouse in winter, with its big boys, its tough customers, and many of them. And Jack Ramsdale, the toughest customer of all. After Mr. Garrison had passed his examination, one of the committee, impressed by what he thought a certain fine gentleman air in the young man, warned him of the rough times in store for him, and especially of the rough strength and insubordination of Jack Ramsdale. Ralph Garrison smiled a calm smile, but uttered no boasts. He had been a week in the school before he had any special trouble. Jack was taking his measure. The truth was, the boy had a certain amount of taste, and Garrison's gentlemanliness impressed him more than he would have cared to own. It is possible that he might have gone on quietly and obediently, but that now his bad name began to weigh him down. The boys who had looked him up to him as a leader in evil grew impatient of his quiet submission to rules. Got your match, Jack? Yeah, yeah, said one. Going to own beat without giving it a try, said another. And Jack began to think that the evil laurels he had won as the bravo and bully of the school would fall withered from his brow if he didn't make some effort to fasten them. So one morning, midway between recess and the close of school, he took out an apple, began paring it with a jackknife and eating it. For a moment, Mr. Garrison looked at him. Then he remarked with ominous quietness, in a tone lower and more gentle than usual, Eh, uh, Jack, this is not a place or a time for eating. Uh, my place and time to eat are when I'm hungry. Jack answered with cool insolence, cutting off a mouthful and carrying a delivery to his mouth. You'll put up that apple instantly, if you please. Still, the teacher spoke very gently and turned a little pale. The persuasive words and the slight paleness misled Jack. He thought his victory was to be so easily won. There would not even be any glory in it, and he smiled and ate quite at his ease. "'Will you come here, whether you please or not?' was the next sentence from the teacher's desk. Jack cut off another mouthful and sat still. Then, he never knew how it was, but suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, he felt himself pulled from his seat out into the middle of the floor while the knife and apple flew from his hand. He kicked, he struggled, he tried to strike, but an iron grasp held his wrists.' The strong muscles of the Stoke Oar at Harvard did good service. The handsome face was pale, but the lips were set like steel, and the cool eyes never wavered as they fixed and held those of the young bully. Then suddenly he whipped from his pocket a ball of strong fish line and bound the struggling wrist tightly, and pushing a chair toward his captive, said coolly, I want nothing more of you till after school. You can sit or stand as you please. Now, I will hear the first class in arithmetic. There's a strange hush in the school, and every scholar knew who was master. 
When all the rest had gone, the teacher turned to Jack Ramsdale. I took you by a little surprise, he said. Perhaps you are not yet uh, satisfied that I'm stronger than you. Yes, I'm satisfied, Jack answered. I ain't so mean, but what I am willing to own beat when it's done fair and square. Mr. Garrison, meanwhile, was untying his wrists. As he unwound the last coil, he said, eh, The forces of law and order are what rule the world. I think if you fight against them, you'll always be likely to find yourself on the losing side. The great bitter wave of defiance swelled up in Jack's heart, not against Mr. Garrison as an individual, but against such as he, handsome, graceful, cultured, against his own hard lot, against a prosperous world, against, it almost seemed, God himself. But do you know about it, he said sullenly. You never had to fight. It was all on your side. God did it. He made you handsome and strong and had you go to school and college and grow up a gentleman. And he made me. How the face darkened here. Well, you see, he took my mother, who did love me and pray for me, away from me when I wasn't more than three years old. He gave me a father who drank hard and taught me nothing good. And then he took even him from me and handed me over to Deacon Small. And I tell you, teacher, you don't know what a tough time is till you've summered and wintered with Deacon Small. I've got a bad name, and who wonders? And I feel like living up to it. I hadn't anything against you, especially, but if I'd given in peaceably to all your rules, the boys would have said I'd grown chicken-hearted. And a little name for pluck is all the same as I got. Mr. Garrison looked at him a few moments, steadily. Then he said, eh, It does seem as if fate has been hard on you, but do you know what I think God has been doing for you in giving you all these hard knocks? For things don't happen. God never lets go of the reins. The boy looked. Uh, the question, he did not speak, and Mr. Garrison went on. I think he's been making you strong. Just as rowing against wind and tide makes my wrist strong. Until now, you could fight all your enemies if you would. The thing we are put here for, he continued, is to do our best. And if we're doing that in God's sight, then there's nothing that can prevail against us. Not fate, or foes, or poverty, or any uh, creature. There's nothing in all the universe that is strong enough to stand against a soul that is bound to go up and not down. You may go home now. It was one of Mr. Garrison's merits that he knew when to stop. Jack Ramsdale went home with that last sentence ringing in his ears. There's nothing in all the universe that is strong enough to stand against a soul that is bound to go up and not down. The words went with him all the rest of the day. They lay down with him at night and he looked out his window and fixed his eyes on a bright, far-off star and thought of them. What if he should turn all the strength that was in him to going up and not down? If he did right, uh, who could make him afraid? If he served willingly, he need fear no master. He was very late, and the star, obedient to the law which rules the world, had marched far on out of his sight. Before he went to sleep, he made a resolve. In the strength of that resolve, he awoke to a new day. I will not go down, he said to himself. I will go up and on. He was not at all once transformed from a sinner to a saint. Such sudden changes do not belong to this slow world. But the purpose and aim of his life has changed. Never again did he lose sight of the shining heights he meant to climb. If his mother in the heavenly home could look down on the world below, she knew that not in vain had she been a, quote, praying woman. To Mr. Garrison, the boy's devotion was something wonderful, humble, loyal, faithful, and never ceasing. From being the teacher's terror, Jack had become the teacher's friend. The End And as you drift off into sleep, let's reflect for a moment on the moral to this story. A problem as old as time itself, bullies, requires a solution just as 
uh, timeless. Rowing hands. If you take rowing, you get to have strong wrists and forearms, which are great for pinning down a small boy and tying him up against his will, and leaving him like that for a whole day. Another timeless solution? Quote the Bible at him, and uh, then he'll just kind of shape up. So, you can do that in a public school. That's just instant results. And, uh, and the, the angry boy will shape up over time. So, as you sleep, think about ways that you could improve your life by getting tied up and having the Bible quoted at you. And uh, start the day fresh tomorrow with a new outlook. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's story. And uh, I hope you listen in the future as you allow me to read you a bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs>